All right, good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and start with some introductory slides as people are still signing on. Um, welcome to the virtual gardening class for November. This is Maintaining a Sustainable Landscape. Going to share a little bit of information about SCV Water. I know some of you are regular attendees of our classes, so it might be some um, old news for you, but just in case we got any new folks joining us today. Um, Zoom webinar, I know a lot of you are familiar with this now. There's a couple of features down at the bottom that will help you participate. You can use the chat um, or the Q&A function at the bottom. Um, we prefer you save your questions till the end, um, but you can type them in there um, so that you don't forget and we'll be sure and get to all of them. The class will be about 45 minutes long or so and then we'll have time for Q&A. CV Water, uh, as you probably know, is the full service regional water agency here in Santa Clarita. We serve the entire area, um, about 70, well, we need to update that. We're at about 75,000 retail customers now over our 195 square miles. We are in the midst of a severe drought and we have some watering requirements in effect where if you have a house with an odd address, you water Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and even addresses water Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. And just November 1st, um, the times change for watering. So you actually get a little bit more time, but we still want you to water early morning or late at night. So I think you can water till 9 a.m. or after 8 p.m. And you can find that on our droughtreadyscv.com website. We've got a lot of rebate programs and resources to help you save water and money. You go to this address, conserve.yourscvwater.com. Um, tons of information for um, you know, everything from uh, free, more water efficient um, fixtures that you can get, services that we offer. Um, if you are looking to really just in, in continue to improve and grow your uh, water efficient landscape, we've have a new top 100 SCB friendly plant guide, which is this beautiful full color brochure that lists um, 100 plants that do well here in the Santa Clarita Valley. We also offer a water smart workshop. You do this online at your own pace. And when you complete it, you get a $20 credit on your water bill. It helps you learn how to read your water bill, identify fixed leaks and other water efficient measures. Uh, the rebates I mentioned, one of those is with the smart irrigation controller rebate. You buy the, re the proper um, controller and submit the information to us. We can give you up to $150 back. Um, it's so easy. And when we get these little sprinkles of rain, which are enough to let us not water for a day or two, you can just turn things off right from your phone. Uh, we also have revamped our lawn replacement program where now you can earn $3 a square foot or more if you add some nat native plants and some other backing incentives. Um, and watch for information later this month and we'll send out an email to our whole gardening class list. We're gonna be doing a lawn replacement program webinar where that's strictly what we'll be talking about, how you get started, um, how our program works, how to, how to apply. So watch for that if that's something that you're interested in. We have. Um, 100 applications in the queue right now, where usually we get a couple of years. So people are really taking advantage of it this time around. Uh, we've also got the HELP program, which is more on the irrigation side, where you can get drip irrigation conversion rebates, um, high efficiency nozzle, nozzles. And what's cool about this is if you do drip irrigation or the high efficiency nozzles, those watering restrictions actually don't apply. You can water on any day of the week um, if you've got the these um, more efficient ways to water. And as you can tell, we're on Zoom now. We did used to be on, um, I don't remember, we were on a different platform, but we were doing Zoom all the way through this year. All right, I am going to stop my share and turn it over to our instructor today, Steve Williams, and he will take over. Go ahead, Steve. Thank you, Kathy. Let me pull this up here and make sure we've got this going. Maintaining a sustainable landscape. Uh, so today we're going to give you uh, some tips and hints on ways that you can be more sustainable in your irrigation in your garden. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the principles of irrigation here. Uh, some important things to keep in mind when you do water is uh, the type of plants that you're watering, the depth of the roots on those plants. Um, trees versus turf. Trees have a deeper root system. 
Uh, turf has a much uh, smaller or not as deep system, so you don't have to water as much. So the type of soil that you have, um, most of you in the region have clay soil, heavy clay type soil, but I know there is a percentage of you who have sand. It's, it's probably about 5% of the folks that I deal with. So we treat them a little bit differently. Your sandy soil, of course, uh, the water flows through it very quickly. So to help hold water better, you can incorporate compost with that, and that'll help the, the holding, water holding capacity of that soil. Now, clay is a different story. Um, trying to move water through that can be very difficult. Um, we'll talk about that in just a moment here. So the type of plants that you have, um, let's talk about a drought tolerant plant versus a high water use tropical plant. Again, different types of plant material, different water needs. The type of irrigation system that you have in your home. Kathy was talking about the drip that is very efficient and uh, allows you to do more watering uh, very efficiently and ride by the whole uh, restrictions. So throughout the year, of course, we have different conditions that exist. Right now, it's a little more humid, um, which helps with our, our water. We don't need to use quite, quite as much. But when we have windy situations or very sunny situations, that's a drying effect. Uh, shade, of course, shady areas don't need as much irrigation, but the temperature, when we have high temperatures of 110 in the summertime, of course, then our water needs are much greater. So we have to take all these variables into consideration and note that your water needs do vary month by month. And typically midsummer is the hottest time and when we need to apply the most water to our, our gardens, the needs are greatest of our plants. What, what is happening is that the evapotranspiration, this is the water loss from the soil and the plants. They have calculated this out to determine how much is lost during different times of the year. And as you can see, midsummer is when we lose the most water to this evapotranspiration. So that old mantra it's that we've got deep but infrequent watering. This is very important because we want to get the water down and send the roots down deep as well, so that in times when there are drought, the roots can dry, uh, delve upon that water and pull that water up and utilize it. Also, if we water too much, we don't have oxygen in the soil. Air is very important to a healthy soil. So we water deep and then we have a break and allow oxygen then to penetrate into the ground area as well. Uh, important for roots to have oxygen around their, their root zone. So if you have this heavy clay soil and you're trying to water your turf especially, you might find that you have runoff. And of course we wanna eliminate runoff. That's a waste of water, a waste of a valuable resource, so we can use the cycle setting on your time clock, which allows you to run that water for maybe five minutes now, and then in a half hour later, run it for another five minutes and get in your 10 minutes of water that you might be doing on that particular cycle. So again, it's, it's uh, uh, changing the cycle so that you have uh, separate short cycles that will prevent runoff from your property. And as I mentioned, watering deep, and that's where uh, deep and frequent watering will get the water down to that root zone and force the roots down deeper. Um, so a deeper rooted plant during times of drought will uh, make it through that time much better. As you can see here, um, the drought tolerance, the deep roots are drawing upon moisture, the shallow roots don't have moisture in their zone to draw upon, and the plant suffers. So. Uh, deep and frequent watering, keep that in mind. That's a very important thing to, to recall. So as Kathy was saying, the best time to water for different reasons is early morning is really the very best from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, during this time, the plants are losing the least amount of water to transpiration. They're, they're holding their water. Um, in the late afternoon, if you were to water at that time of day, um, and the plants stay wet then through the evening, you potentially could have diseases that would occur on your plants. Um, so we like to water early morning, the sun comes up, dries the leaves off, the plants then don't have that, uh, that uh, ability then to promote these diseases, these airborne diseases that can occur. So during the daylight hours, of course, if you water during that time, you're losing a lot of water to evaporation, uh, to wind, 
Uh, also, your water pressure is, is best in that early morning time. You have a consistent water pressure and know that every time you water, you're going to have even distribution of water over your area. Uh, during the day, the water pressure fluctuates more and you're not going to have that even coverage with your irrigation. So early morning, uh, best for plants, uh, best for the system to prevent evaporation of water in your garden. So understanding your soil, we mentioned that heavy clay soil is what most of you find in the Santa Clara Vera Valley area, this heavy clay loam. But I know there's a percentage of you, maybe 5% or so, who have the sandy soil. As I mentioned, adding compost to that sandy soil will enable it to hold water better, give it better uh, retention. So back to the clay soil that most of you have, trying to prevent that runoff. Um, but you can make some observations in your garden. If you're noticing that you're, you're having more runoff, particularly on hillside areas uh, or in spots where the soil stays very wet because you've watered maybe too much and it doesn't seem to dry out, or the plants themselves are growing very poorly, they have a small root system. Uh, or last, if the soil is so wet that in reality what's going on is we have an anaerobic situation. So anaerobic soil is where we don't have enough oxygen. We mentioned that earlier, that a healthy soil has oxygen, and that's why watering deeply, giving it a break, allows the oxygen to penetrate into that root zone. If you water your heavy clay soil too much and it stays too wet, potentially then we have the anaerobic situation where we have the, the smelly soil. And root diseases can occur at that point as well. Um, what is happening is the plant isn't getting the proper moisture because it's not penetrating through that heavy clay soil. And consequently then it's not getting nutrients as well. Um, you have poor root development. The um, whole system here is, is compromised um, and the plant itself is gonna suffer and probably die. So along with this, in this heavy clay soil, you have heavy compaction. So when soil is wet, heavy clay soil is wet, we don't wanna walk on it. We don't wanna run heavy equipment on it. We don't wanna drive on it because we'll compact that soil even more. So stay off of wet soil, wet, clay soil. And um, of course, uh, we're going to have more runoff when you develop this compacted area because the water will not penetrate into the zone. So uh, improving the soil can be very difficult, um, but doing some work in rototilling it, amending it, again, compost will be beneficial to improving this clay soil, just as it is with a sandy soil, but for a different reason trying to break up this clay and allow the penetration of water through that, that zone much better. So uh, the answer in many cases is compost for either sandy soil or clay soil to make an improvement. So in the Santa Cruz Valley, uh, the reasons why your plants may not be doing very well, um, maybe because when you planted them, they were planted too deep, especially in that heavier clay soil. And this causes a situation that's caused, called girdling, where the crown of the plant, where the, the uh, soil and the plant meet, you're planting it too deep and you're burying that crown point, and then the plant itself is going to, to die. It can't live through that type of a situation. So it's actually better when you plant a plant in a garden to plant it a little bit high, perhaps you know half an inch or three quarters of an inch high to allow it to settle into its spot. This is particularly true of trees and shrubs. So also mulch. Mulch is very important in the garden to help maintain or retain moisture in your soil. But when we plant a plant and we apply mulch in the garden, we don't want to mound the mulch up around the plant. It should be maybe six inches away from that plant. If the mulch is mounded up on the crown of the plant, the same thing can happen. Uh, we'll, we'll girdle that plant. We can kill the plant that way. So um, planting uh, in full sun, of course, recently, the last, what, three years, we've had extreme temperatures. And along with that, of course, uh, we get sunburn. Uh, the cells of the plant are damaged and sometimes beyond repair, beyond coming back. 
uh, it's better when we do have this damage from the sun in the summertime to leave that damaged foliage on there. Just as in the wintertime, if we get a burn from cold, uh, we should leave that damaged foliage on the plant until springtime or until maybe January when we're going to actually do our pruning because that will protect the plant from further damage from cold. And in the summertime, leaving that damaged foliage on there will prevent further sunburn on the, the trunks and the stems of the plant. So um, try to prevent this from happening. Choose where you plant your plants uh, so that they can take these types of conditions, full sun or cold. Now in your property, you have different zones um, where you have temperature changes. You have shady spots that are cooler and you have full sun spots. You have areas where sun is reflected off of your home back to the plants in the garden that gives a double dose of heat. So think about what they're getting in sun and shade and the type of plants that you're planting and their needs that they have making sure that you don't plant them too deep. So weeds. Weeds, of course, are a scourge of our gardens. And many of the weeds that we have are annual weeds that just come in with moisture, with rainfall this type of year, this time of year. So we can use different strategies to control them. One of the ones that I like to, to utilize um, with a weedy situation is uh, some safe products that we're gonna see in just a moment. We have what are called post-emergence that we spray on the weeds after they've grown. And in the past, we've used products like Roundup. Well, you know, Roundup is kind of on the, the do not use list anymore, potential cancer problems. So we're trying to stay away from that. So looking at some safer things here, um, pre-emergence are applied before the weeds come up. And then there's weed cloth that can be utilized, and of course, mulch that we've mentioned. So uh, post-emergence are products that are utilized after the weeds come in. There are some safe ones out there to use that are citric acid-based or vinegar-based, okay? And um, these are very useful in burning out that growth. These type of plants do not come back every year from their roots. They need to produce seed in order to uh, come back the next year. So another product that we can use are called pre-emergence. Pre-emergence are applied to the soil area before the weeds grow, before the rainy season, before those weeds, the weed seeds get germinated and start to emerge. We apply the pre-emergence and they then prevent the seeds from germinating. And then the problem is prevented. So there are some safe products out there for that as well that are corn gluten based. These might be a little more difficult to find, but they work very well on those open areas where you have potential weed growth every year. Now, um, being that you're working with, with seeds, they can be applied to a turf area as well because the turf is already grown. And then this would prevent the weed seeds that are coming along from germinating their seeds. So, very useful in bare soil areas, but also can be used in some turf areas as well. The last, uh, well, the second to last uh, item here is weed barrier cloth. Now, this is rather controversial, actually. The University of California has done research and finding that maybe this isn't the best thing to do. But if you're gonna use weed barrier cloth, make sure that it's cloth material, not plastic. Uh, it needs to be porous. Uh, so that water can penetrate through it and get to the soil area, and also so that oxygen can get to the soil through this material. Uh, you want to overlap edges. You want to cut holes where you're planting the plants through the material. And then you, of course, apply a, a layer of mulch over that. Now, um, the problem with these products is that oftentimes, um, over time, they start to lift up. Um, they start to degrade. Um, they break down and then have to be removed and then have to be thrown into landfill. So keep in mind that the use of mulch alone can oftentimes take care of the problem without using the weed barrier cloth. Um, highly recommended to have a second thought about that before you use the weed barrier cloth. And of course, the last thing that I mentioned is mulch. 
And uh, mulch is uh, one of the best things that we can do in the garden for lots of reasons. It's going to help keep the weeds at bay. It's going to help prevent loss of water from the soil from, from evaporation and uh, evapotranspiration. And uh, it's going to give a nice finished look to the garden. It's going to look good. Um, uh, and there's different sources for it. Okay, so let's look here. Evaporation from the soil reduces those weeds and um, soil loss. It um, moderates the temperature of the soil during the summertime when it's hot and the sun is beating on that soil. It's going to keep that soil cool and moist and help the roots develop better. Again, I mentioned that it looks good. Um, during the uh, winter time, the use of mulch, of course, will help uh, keep that soil um, warmer and um, will be good beneficial for the plants and the roots as well. So um, I like to use at least a four inch layer uh, in, the, in the garden area. We can go as high as six inches, but four inches is, is, is a good amount. And you always wanna keep that, as I said, about six inches from your plants. Uh, otherwise we mound it up on the, the plant itself, we get that crown rot situation. Now, remember you apply mulch and uh, it's going to over time, over a period of a year or two, it's gonna disintegrate, it's gonna break down, it's gonna decompose, it's going to then improve your soil by adding organic material to your soil as well. So you have to reapply. And that may be every couple of years, keeping that good four inch layer in your soil. So there's different sources uh, for getting good quality mulch. And here in the LA area, there are locations, uh, 11 locations where the city of Los Angeles has it available for you to bring your own shovel bag or pickup truck and um, own containers and load it up as much as you need. And these are from tree trimming sources where tree trimmers have uh, dumped it at these locations. I'll give you another good resource is getchipdrop.com. Uh, you go to the website for getchipdrop.com and you fill out your information with your address and the tree trimmers will bring it to your home and drop it on your driveway for you. You don't even have to go get it. Now, they're going to bring you a lot. It could be as much as 13 yards, so you have to be ready to take all of it. You can specify that you don't want certain types of wood, like maybe you don't want eucalyptus or pine, which seem to be a little more problematic. Um, so I have very good results with that, but be ready for a lot. Uh, otherwise, you can go to one of these locations and pick it up, bring it home, and apply that in those open spaced areas throughout your garden. You know, it gives a real finished look as well. So um, beneficial and good looking. So let's go uh, into a little bit about turf itself. And uh, we do have two general categories of turf. So for you to better understand what you may have and the needs that, that your turf actually does have, we have cool season grasses um, that stay green year round. During the summertime, the heat they can take that. In the wintertime, cool temperatures, you're going to have a green lawn. Um, then we have the warm season grasses. These go dormant in the wintertime. They turn brown. Not as attractive, but they use a lot less water than those cool season grasses. So let's take a little closer look here. Uh, your cool season grasses, um, these are your tall type fescues, your marathon type of, of grasses. We also have rye grasses which come either perennial or annual and, um, and kind of keep away from those annual perennial rise because uh, if we plant those in the winter time as an over uh, covering over our, our warm season grasses just to have something green, then come springtime, it's kind of hard to get rid of that rye grass. And, and then we have a competition going on between the two grasses. Another cool season grass would be a Kentucky blue or bent grass. And oftentimes you'll even find that there's mixtures of all of these in, in a formulation that the manufacturers have put together. So the cool season grasses um, have their most of their growth in the springtime. Um, and uh, then during the heat of the summer, the growth dies back, not dies back, but isn't as much. And notice also when it's actively growing, it has a longer root system as well. When it dies back just a little bit, the root system also is much less. During the winter time, you do have green growth, but again, you have less rooting, um, a little less growth. So the water needs are a little bit less during the winter on your cool season grasses. 
but you have high water use during the hottest time of uh, spring and, and in fall for those tall um, fescue type grasses. Now for warm season grasses, uh, we have the hybrid Bermudas, the turf type common Bermudas, St. Augustine, Zoysias, and the buffalo grass. There's a UC Verde buffalo grass, which was developed by the University of California, which is very drought tolerant. And these grasses, of course, have their most active growing during the hottest time of the summer. And their root system is the biggest at that time. And then come uh, into fall and winter time, as you see, as it gets cooler, this grass browns out and the root system is much less as well. So obviously the water needs are much less on a warm season grass during that winter season. But of course, during the summertime, it, it uses the most water and you must apply it during that time. So a little understanding of what type of turf that you have and what its needs are at different times of the year. So to make your grass more drought tolerant, your turf area more drought tolerant, we can uh, apply certain practices. One would be during the summertime to raise the blades on your lawnmower a bit higher, as high as you can in many cases, three and a half inches or four inches if you can do it. Because what this does is it a, a longer grass blade shades the soil and reduces the evaporation of moisture from the soil. So then you don't have to water as much. And so reduce the amount of times that you're watering uh, during the summertime to keep the grass blades much longer. Uh, other things that we can do, uh, we'll show you some examples in a minute here is dethatching which is removing this organic layer that develops right at the, so uh, the soil line of dead plant material, living plant material, and forms this restrictive layer that prevents water from penetrating into the soil. So we can dethatch. Uh, another thing we can do to help improve infiltration of both water and air into that turf zone is, is to aerate. Um, so uh, along with this, of course, using fertilizers that have a little bit more phosphorus, which is a greater need of turf. Also remember that your fertilizers, as we'll talk about in a few minutes here, nitrogen is a, a need for turf in particular, is a huge nitrogen user. Now, as you mentioned before, do not overseed a um, warm season grass um, with a winter color, a winter rye, because you're gonna have a hard time come spring to get rid of that, that uh, winter rye grass. So mowing the grass higher uh, will also develop a deeper root system. The taller the grass blades, the deeper the roots, which will enable it to draw upon moisture better as well. And as I mentioned, the tall grass blades shade the soil and reduce evaporation. When you do mow, you wanna make sure that the blades on your lawnmower are sharp. Uh, as you can see on the left here, with a sharp blade, we get a nice clean cut. If the blades are dull, we get a ragged cut here. And this type of uh, cut on the blade will enable diseases to enter that grass blade much better than a clean cut. So make sure the blades are sharp on your lawnmower and it will help prevent diseases in your turf area as well. So the dethatching, here's a device that does just that. Uh, as we roll over this area where we have this dead and living organic material at the soil line, it, it pulls that stuff up, it yanks it up. And then you come along afterwards, you need to rake this material off of the turf and then proceed at that point. So dethatching um, done can be done annually if you, if you need to. It may be only every couple of years you really need to do it. And it is done in the fall. So now's the time for this process. Uh, this type of equipment can be rented at a, an equipment rental yard um, at a half day type of rate, or if you have a gardener and request that they could do it for you, I'm sure they'll charge you a pretty penny to do it. Um, here's another device, an aerator, where we have a device that you again can rent that goes through and removes plugs of soil from the soil area, from the, the turf area. So as you can see here, we have this the grass growing, we have the roots, but we have this thatch layer that prevents water from penetrating that root zone of the turf. So if we remove these cores of soil, then it allows the water to penetrate. 
nutrients to penetrate and roots to grow much stronger and deeper. So when we do remove these cores, we want to rake them off of the lawn as well. We don't want to leave them there. And it's a good idea to come back and actually apply a very fine compost or um, a Kellogg talker type product. It's a very fine compost and fill in these cores that you've removed. And then again, it's going to allow the roots to grow much stronger and better, water to penetrate and nutrients to get down to that root zone as well. So removing the cores, coming back and applying your fine compost or topper into those plugs that you've removed. So um, fertilizing, and uh, do you need to fertilize? You know, uh, if you, we're gonna learn in a moment here, the use of compost in the garden can provide many of the nutrients that we need, but looking for deficiencies in your plants, here's a little uh, diagram here that can show you uh, if we have foliage or leaves that are off color, um, if you have a leaf that is entirely uh, yellow, the leaf itself, the veins are yellowed, then it's likely a nitrogen deficiency. Now, nutrient-wise in the garden, nitrogen is a water-soluble nutrient. Your other nutrients are not water-soluble. They'll stay in place much better. But being water-soluble, nitrogen must be applied more often than your other nutrients. So you'll find that um, come springtime is a, is a good time to do your fertilizing. As it turns out, in the cold of winter, many of the nutrients that you would apply cannot be utilized. They need warm soil conditions in order to be utilized by the plant. So hold off on fertilizing until spring. Um, other deficiencies that you may see here, iron is another common deficiency. Where the leaf of your plant, the veins will be green, but the leaf itself will be yellow. And that indicates an iron deficiency. So there are other deficiencies as well, potassium, uh, manganese, uh, magnesium, a uh, phosphate, where we can detect these deficiencies. But you can actually, if you have a, a real problem in your garden, um, you can actually get your soil tested uh, with a home test kit that will test for your primary nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, or you can send that sample to a soil lab where they'll do a professional test on it and determine what deficiencies that you have and how you can balance or improve that soil. Now, farmers oftentimes will send actual leaves of a plant to a test lab and they can test the leaf itself and find out deficiencies. Now, these tests cost about $60 a piece. So we don't do a lot of them, but um, you know, if you're, if you're having issues, it can be done and you can diagnose the problem and come up with a real answer of what you need to do to, your, to improve conditions for your plants. So with a deficiency, your, your plants may be stunted. Uh, you might have poor flower and fruit production and development in the garden. And uh, so looking for these deficiencies and, and making changes will improve your plant growth, of course. So fertilizers here are utilized to opt optimize the plant's performance. And they're going to improve the growth, the rooting, and the fruiting and flowering production of that plant. Um, they're going to replace deficiencies that you might have and enhance availability of other nutrients that are there. But as I said, it's important that you determine what you need to apply uh, instead of just willy-nilly applying nutrients in the garden. We really want to try to um, not over-apply. So there's different ways that we can apply these fertilizers. <clears throat> they can be applied to the soil, uh, to the root zone itself, or in some cases, we can spray a liquid fertilizer on the foliage. A good example of that would be for that iron deficiency. We can utilize a, a chelated iron product that can be sprayed on the leaves. It's absorbed very quickly and will overcome that iron deficiency. There are quick release fertilizers that are typically um, ones that have been manufactured. They're not organic and natural. Um, they have more of the ability then to burn your plants with that nitrogen. If you're not too careful about it, you can uh, actually have burning. So slow release fertilizers are gonna release the nutrients at a slower rate and you have less risk of nitrogen burn. Uh, then you have organic formulations and you can even get organic formulations that are slow released. 
but typically organic fertilizers do take longer to release their nutrients to the plants because they have to have this interaction with the soil, with warm conditions in the soil, and with microorganisms that also help break down and make those nutrients available. So your synthetic manufactured fertilizers are quick release generally, a risk of burn perhaps with nitrogen, uh, your organic and slow release fertilizers are safer for your plants and will fertilize that over a longer period of time and release it slowly so it's safer for the plant itself. So on that bag of fertilizer, you again have the three primary nutrients that you see listed in numbers in this order, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, so they must have these on the bag. This is showing the percentage of those nutrients in the bag itself. So here we see an example of a bag that has uh, even numbers of 10, 10, 10. So 10% uh, nitrogen, 10% uh, phosphorus, and 10 of the potassium. Um, so notice that uh, the potassium is also called potash, and it's ind indicated by the letter K. So nitrogen has the letter N, uh, phosphorus is the letter P, and potassium is the, the letter K to indicate those nutrients. Um, so potassium um, may be useful to help reducing stress in the plants and then um, during times of drought and, and help that plant overcome drought conditions much better. So consider that in your applications of fertilizer in the garden. So um, here we have some products. Again, you can see two different bags here, a named product here, a national product, or a more of a localized product here. They're both a 10, 10, 10. So the point here is that price or cost, they're essentially the same thing. So uh, we've compared the numbers of the nutrients are the same. So you could buy the cheaper product would give you the same effect as buying the more expensive one. And uh, that's the principle that we're trying to indicate here to you. Here we see the same thing. We see two different products, but actually one is labeled as a turf product. One is labeled as a palm fertilizer. But notice the nutrients are very close to the same. 1358 and 1668. So we could use this palm fertilizer again in that turf application as well. It may be a less expensive than the more expensive Bandini brand. So um, don't let price dictate quality. Um, look at the numbers and uh, what you're applying and the purpose that you're using it for. So general rules for applying your fertilizers is that um, we, we talked about the slow releases, less chance of, of burn of your plants, uh, having steady, even growth. Uh, we, we apply our fertilizers in early spring. Now, early fall is kind of already passed. So early fall would have been uh, during September, mean to October, perhaps October, uh, to apply, particularly on turf. Remember, as I mentioned before, that fertilizers need warm soils to mo work most effectively. Uh, there are some exceptions. There are some products that will work in cool temperatures, but um, for most of us, applying our fertilizers in spring, perhaps one application in the fall as well, will be beneficial and be satisfactory for your plants. So we like the soil to be moist before we apply the fertilizer. So the day before fertilizing, we should have watered our garden and and also the leaves of the plants should be well imbibed with that moisture as well. We don't want to water a plant that's dry. So the soil is moist, the plants have imbibed water. Uh, when we do apply the fertilizer, stay on a turf area. We want to make sure that the grass blades are dry when we apply that product. But then after we apply this product, we want to be sure to water it in well on that turf area in particular. Uh, but any application, we'll want to water it in after we apply our fertilizers. Um, you know, fertilizers can come in granulated forms uh, as well as liquid formulations as well. They can be applied and uh, watered into as you're applying it into the soil. So regular applications of mulch in the garden can reduce the need for fertilizers. As I mentioned before, as the mulch is decomposing and breaking down, it's releasing nutrients to the plants as well. So, you know, there are folks who 
simply use mulch in their gardens and don't add any extra fertilizers at all and have wonderful gardens. So something to consider, um, price, labor, um, needs for your plants and uh, what, what the best thing to do for your plants is. And, and it may be individual cases. Certain things may need fertilizing and other areas don't need any at all. So compost. Compost uh, is one of those wonderful products, as we said in the very beginning, that we can utilize that to improve either a heavy clay soil or a sandy soil. It's going to improve the soil structure. Uh, it's going to provide nutrients uh, to the plants. And actually, they'll be released much faster than, than uh, mulch. A compost will release those nutrients to the plants very quickly. Um, so uh, a good program is uh, utilizing the compost in your garden to amend planting areas on a regular basis. For example, if you have uh, a garden space, a vegetable or a flower garden that you're changing over a couple of times a year, at every new planting, you'd want to amend that area with your compost for the next planting. And again, only use the fertilizers when you need to for certain deficiencies on particular plants. You'll find that compost and mulch combined will give you all the nutrient needs that your plants need in the garden. So let's talk a little bit about pruning. Um, so we um, have our plants growing. Uh, one of the things to, to remember is the definition, of course, it's the art and science of systematically removing unwanted plant growth. But whenever we do this, it's going to encourage new growth on the plant. And remember that in the very first place, when you choose a tree or shrub to plant in your garden, that you should select that plant based on the size it will be at maturity. Uh, do some research. Find if that plant will fit the space that you're planting in so that it won't require excess pruning. It'd be nice if the plant would go to a mature size and throughout its life would just need minor pruning uh, throughout the season. So um, select the plant to fit the space. Uh, whenever you do prune, you're going to get new growth and uh, you'll be doing this annually. So reasons why we prune. Well, safety. We don't want to have any limbs falling and hurting a person or damaging the structure. So safety in your property is one of the first reasons. Then of course, we pruning plants will train that plant into a desired shape or form. Um, folks will do things like topiary, for example. We can take uh, multi-trunk trees and hedges and form them into all kinds of things topiary wise or just um, attractive shapes in the garden. It may be that you have an older plant that has not been pruned over the years, it's overgrown, it's got a lot of dead wood. So we wanna rejuvenate that plant. So we may do a severe pruning on that plant to then stimulate new growth. Another reason for pruning, um, it's going to improve and increase the flowering on a flowering and fruiting plant. So if you have a fruit tree, the uh, deciduous fruit tree, peaches, plums, nectarines, those need to have regular pruning that will stimulate new growth that will provide the flowering and fruiting on that tree. Um, also important to remember on fruit trees is that we need to thin out the fruit. So uh, for example, on a apricot tree, we should thin the fruit out to about four to five inches between the fruit. On a peach, we can go to maybe six inches between the fruit on the tree. This will give you larger, better quality fruit instead of a lot of small pruny fruit, okay? So um, thin your fruit out. Uh, it can be done when the flowers come into play and thinning out the flowers on that fruit tree. Um, so opening up the center of a, any plant, any tree or shrub, allowing better light and oxygen to the center of that tree will improve its growth. And if it's a flowering or fruiting tree, it's going to be essential to proper development and good production on that tree. So opening the center for air and light um, and here you can see that particularly during a drought situation, we're looking at less pruning on our plants. Uh, during our ongoing drought, which now, you know, we're into a six or seven year of the short-term drought, but we're into like a 22nd year of a long-term drought situation and our plants are stressed. 
Uh, it's difficult for them to survive with this high heat. So we don't want to do a lot of excess pruning on these trees. That gives them more stress and then will be more difficult for them to effectively grow. So you can see here where at, at most one third of the growth has been removed from this tree to give you on the right a tree that has a little bit more open space, air and light circulation. But um, be stingy during this drought period because the plants are already stressed out. So um, that's the end of my information that I have for you. And I have time if there's any questions that we have. Let me stop my share here. And um, well, I don't see too much here. Thrips. Okay, what causes thrips? Well, thrips are just a pest that we can have in the garden. And um, there's uh, particularly roses. I know that there's the, the, the newer thrip that we have on roses. And uh, to control them, we've discovered that a, a, a three-part uh, punch would be a good way to go. So uh, we have um, different products that we can use. We have uh, oils and we have soaps and we have other um, insecticides that we can use. So if we then one week spray that rose plant, for example, with the uh, light horticultural oil, the next week we use the, this soap. Then the third week, we use a safe insecticide. And um, with that one, two, three punch, um, and we can then repeat this perhaps a second time around, and we should have that thrip problem under control in the garden. So uh, using different products uh, every time on a weekly basis, every five to seven days should give you satisfaction. Uh, let's see, was there anything else here? Kathy's uh, added the Get Chip Drop site for you. And um, if there's any other questions that I can answer at this time, I'm happy to do so. So I guess we've uh, completed this today and uh, hope to see you again for these regular uh, monthly classes that are taught here through the Santa Clarita Valley. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve, and thank everyone for joining us. I dropped the link. Um, we've got one more class for this year, but Laura is already working on a schedule for next year. Um, most will still be virtual, but we are looking to add a quarterly in-person, more workshop style class. So um, lots of great ideas. And a lot of that has been based on feedback we've gotten from you, uh, our attendees this year. So we appreciate that. So be on the lookout for an email with our 2023 schedule coming soon. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Kathy. Bye now. Bye.